welcome everybody to the inaugural What Does It Mean to Be a Buckeye? I am so surprised that so many of you are here this afternoon just to see me. <laughs> I mean, I feel overwhelmed and incredibly grateful that we could pull in this many people on a Thursday before a holiday for me. I'm very clear that this is not about me at all. This is about the incomparable and amazing uh, Gus Johnson. I am so excited and honored to be able to share both time and space um, with Gus. We've had some time together um, today, and I just have to tell you all, you are in for a treat. As dynamic as he is in the broadcast booth, he's even better in person. So without further ado, let's run a little highlight reel of Gus Johnson and then we'll bring him on out. From the legendary shoe, the world famous Ohio State Buckeyes. Elliot again, 40, 30, 20. They're playing that Buckeye swag song already. Here's Jones dropping back. Give it up for Gus, you all. So I have to tell you, I had like a four page bio on Gus. And when we did our run through, I kept walking back and forth and it was still 20 minutes and I was still talking and walking. So we decided to sort of tighten up his, his bio um, so that he can actually tell more of his story that tells you more about exactly who Gus Johnson is. So I have just a brief paragraph here and then we're gonna bring him out. The most exciting voice in all of sports broadcasting, Gus Johnson is the lead play-by-play -play announcer for Fox Sports, college football and college basketball coverage. Johnson has served as Fox Sports lead college football play-by-play -play voice since 2011 and of the network's college basketball coverage since 2013, the very first year Fox Sports carried national college basketball games. Johnson also contributes to Fox Sports NFL coverage for a select slate of games in the booth. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming the man who says he'll roll up on you folks and let you smell his cologne, play-by-play -play announcer, Gus Johnson. All right, all right, all right. Let's do this. Thank you for having me. Of course, of course. Have a seat. You got it. We're just going to have a little conversation in front of a few of our hundred of our favorite friends. Nice. Is that good with you? Nice. That's good? Perfect. You ready? I, well, I have to start off by saying, Gus, I appreciate the, the nod to the Ohio State with all the scarlet and gray. You see? When and, you're wrong, winners. And I, well, I want to... I wanna Talk about it a little bit because I was able to get some coverage of you in the state up north. Uh, that's and where I'm from. That I get it, yes. <laughs> and you were greeting the coach from the school up north. Yes. And you admired him as a mentor and supporter. Yes, ma'am. But today, I just want to call it out, but today you're all about the Buckeyes. Oh, there's no doubt about it. Like I said, it's nice to be around winners. 
good comeback. You see my, I came, right? I, I, I did it right, right? Scarlett and Gray. <laughs> Thank you for playing along with mm -hmm. that. Yeah, got it. Yeah, well, I know that you have covered Ohio State athletics for over 25 years years. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And just based on the, the clip that we watched of you before mm -hmm. you came out, we could tell and sense your energy and passion just for the game, but certainly that for Ohio State. What are some of those moments, Gus, that you will never forget in, in being a part of the Ohio State athletic program? And tell us what is it like when you have those moments and you see those plays that nobody can see coming? But you're in the moment and you're trying to tell the whole world about what's happening while you're also witnessing it. Well, first of all, Dr. Shivers, words can't express the amount of gratitude that I have in my heart to be around Ohio State University um, and this athletic program. I've had a chance to experience some of the great moments of my career. You know, as a sportscaster, you're, you're kind of judged by not only the moments that you have, during the broadcast, but how you handle those moments. Mm -hmm. And fortunately, being around Ohio State, I've just had a plethora of moments that I haven't dropped the ball on, which is cool. <laughs> you know, um, but looking back at it, and you guys just saw football, but basketball, I mean, right. let's look back. Um, Matt Sylvester, a lot of you guys are young, you probably don't even remember this, but for the older people in the room, Matt Sylvester, hitting the shot against Illinois when they were undefeated here in Columbus. We just celebrated the 20th anniversary of that shot. I think this past year, during basketball season, this past year, Jimmy Jackson and I were, were, were calling uh, Illinois uh, uh, Ohio State game. I don't remember who, the, uh, Michigan actually. And uh, we celebrated the 20th year, uh, the 20th anniversary of that shot. Um, even more from a basketball perspective, Ron Lewis hitting the shot against Xavier to send the game into overtime in Lexington, Kentucky. And that was the year Ohio State went on to play in the national championship game with Greg Oden and those cats. Um, so, and that's just basketball. Mm -hmm. Football, and as you saw, man, some of those moments were just, uh, JT Barrett leading Ohio State back against Penn State at night. Saquon Barkley is playing for Penn State and at that particular time, the storyline was JT Barrett couldn't win a big game. But boy, he won a big game that night. Huge game. And he came back, led him to victory. And uh, you got barbecue back there and you didn't invite me. <laughs> now, see, what I was thinking about during that game, before that game, I don't know why. But I was thinking about barbecue. And I was saying to myself, if somebody had a barbecue and they didn't invite me, that would hurt my feelings. <laughs> and I would really want to punch somebody in the mouth. So uh, this award, that was a devastating hit. And it just popped in my head. You got barbecue back there and you didn't invite me? Oh, I'm a, you don't hurt my feelings? Nah, I'm going to give it to you. Um, but, but who could ever forget? And to me, this is one of the great moments in the history of my career. Cardale Jones. Mm. Think about that story, guys. Think about a young man from Cleveland, Ohio, looking for an opportunity, didn't get it up until this point. But all of a sudden, Braxton Miller goes down, JT Barrett goes down, the third string quarterback not only has to come in and win a game, but he's got to come in and win the Big Ten championship. Not only does he have to come in and win the Big Ten championship, he's got to come in and win the national championship. And that's exactly what he did out of nowhere. And to me, that story doesn't just talk about Cardell Jones. That story talks about the preparation of an Ohio State student, not student athlete a student that has the mental ability to focus and concentrate when everything is on the line. I'm talking about a national championship. They beat the brakes off of Wisconsin, and then he went into that game with Alabama, and to me, 
the Oregon game was a great game. But that Alabama game, <laughs> when Nick Saban was stuttering at halftime during the interview, <laughs> go back and look at that. He was stuttering. His hands were shaking. He was like, I, well, well, I, and they were winning. And they were winning. <laughs> But the moment that, you know, and as a reporter, I get an opportunity to, to get some inside information. When Cardell Jones, I don't know if you guys remember, when he ran over that safety and he stood over that safety and that safety, I can't remember his name right now, but he was an All-American. He's in the NFL right now. He stood over that safety and you know what he said to him? And I'm going to give you the PG version. <laughs> he said, boy, get up because I'm not done with you yet. Wow. And that's a true story. And the Buckeyes weren't done with the Crimson Tide, and then they went on to almost break Marcus Mariota, the Oregon quarterback, in half and win the national championship. And for me, I didn't call those two last games, the semifinal and the final, but I did call the Big Ten championship. I did have a chance to call the game when Cardale Jones came in as a third-string quarterback out of the blue and won because he was prepared and he was supported, not only by his team, but he was supported by his school, by his state, by the alumni, one of the biggest alumni groups in all of America. They supported Cardell Jones that day. He went on and helped the Buckeyes win that game and eventually a national championship. And to me, that left an indelible impression in my mind about what can be done through teamwork, through commitment, through sacrifice, through compassion, all those things that you need to be a winner. And as I just mentioned, when I came out here, I'm at Ohio State today. I got on my scarlet and gray because I'm around a bunch of winners, and that makes me feel good. So you've been around the program for athletic program for about 25 years, but your love for Ohio State and your knowledge and awareness of Ohio State started well before then when you were young. Tell us about those experiences. Well, I've been knowing about Ohio State since I was a baby and not just because of Michigan, Ohio State, but because of my dad. Um, daddy was from Louisville, Kentucky, and he came up hard, meaning racism in the South, uh, segregation, all those kind of things that we know about and we continue to learn about. But he traveled to Detroit in the 50s during urban migration, and urban migration was uh, basically he wanted to come up to the big city and get a job in the plant. Daddy used to always say, boy, I got here on a Thursday in Detroit, and I was working at Chrysler on Monday. <laughs> and back then, you know, it was really nice when you worked in the plant. You not only had a good job, but you can afford to maybe have a boat or summer house and stuff like that, cottage. But Daddy, Daddy loved sports. He wasn't an athlete. He didn't participate in sports. He was more of a singer and a dancer, but he loved the stories of sports. In, in, in today's world, especially in academia, there's been a big transfer into, and I want you guys to keep this in mind, there's been a big transfer. Like there's a guy, uh, former IBM executive, his name was uh, David, I think it's David Snowden, IBM executive. He created the Cinefin system which is a system that allows you to kind of, if you're in management, to critique people that work for you, to find out you know, where they, they are. Take, you know, check out the Cinefin system when you get a chance, when you leave here. Anyway, he said that, as an IBM executive, he said one of the most important things now in business is storytelling. He feels that storytelling is very important to understand somebody's origin story or creation story. Um, and a lot of kids today in elementary school, as a matter of fact, my partner Joel Klatt's uh, son, Henry, is 10 years old, and he's studying origin stories. Um, I'm taking a graduate, I'm in a graduate program right now where we're talking about creation stories, so it's storytelling. So daddy was a great storyteller. He was a singer, uh, and he just had a rhythm. 
So he started telling me this story when I was about probably eight or nine, Dr. Shivers, about this man, this man that came from Alabama and he moved to Cleveland, Ohio, and he was fast. And he ended up getting a scholarship to this really cool university in Ohio, and he ran track for him. And not only was he a great track star, but he was the best world record holder. And he was challenged during his time at this university to go to the Olympics and compete in the Olympics. And it was a very interesting Olympics that year. It was 1936, and the Olympics were in Berlin, Germany. And the world was on the brink of war. And there was this bad man in Germany that was promoting a theory of racial supremacy. And Jesse Owens was that man's name. And he went to Germany, Berlin, in this bad man's backyard, at his, as the kids would say, at his crib, and put a whooping on him. The worst whooping, four gold medals, 100, 200, four by 100, long jump, right in this man's face when he was promoting that there was a supreme race of people. Well, what Jesse Owens did, Daddy used to say, he said, son, he proved to the whole world that that man could be beat in 1936 with those four gold medals. So proving that that man could be beat was a statement to the entire world. And where did that young man come from? Oh yeah, he came from Alabama. He came from Cleveland. But look at that picture. That man represented the Ohio State University. And at that particular time, the Buckeye bullet and Ohio State became world famous. The whole world knew about Jesse and Ohio State. So that's why when you see me call the game nowadays, you, you see me, you hear me, you may hear me say the world famous Ohio State University, the world famous Ohio State University. That is an ode to him. And it's something that we can never forget. Now think about it, daddy used to say, daddy would be like, now think about it, son. He went over and did all that, represented the United States, represented Ohio State University, represented the positive side of the world that eventually was gonna have to beat back this bad man. But then he came back and because of the rules and the laws and the racism in our country, he couldn't even stay at the dorm with his classmates. Think about that, what kind of effect that can have on your psyche. You go over here and, as history would write it, you help in your part save the world. But then you come home and you're treated, you know, like a, a person that's not a human being. But Jesse, I went over to the Jesse statue today to prepare for you guys. And this is the first time I'd ever, I had ever been to it, Dr. Shivers. And this is what it reads at the bottom of the statue. We all have dreams, but in order to make dreams come into reality, it takes an awful lot of determination, dedication, self-discipline, and effort. It behooves a man with a God-given ability to stand 10 feet tall. And this is the one that really gets to me in my heart. Ability to stand 10 feet tall, you never know how many youngsters may be watching. Mm. That's right on your campus right here. So 
when we talk about the spirit of the Buckeye, when I talk about the spirit of the Buckeye, when I was inspired to come and just have a conversation with you guys, this is not a lecture, this is not a speech, it's a conversation with Dr. Shivers. When I thought about it, the spirit of the Buckeye is the spirit of sacrifice, commitment, compassion, doing something for somebody else and not paying attention to doing something for you, for me. And I think that's the spirit of the Buckeye. That goes all the way back to 1936 and when that man achieved those feats under those, you know, circumstances with that kind of pressure on him. And he did it. And to me, that's all about Ohio State. It's an ode to Jesse Owens, and that's why I'm a big fan of being around this school. Thank you. I really appreciate your comments, in particular around the importance of, of commitment. And you made a, a commitment recently. I think in 2021, mm -hmm. you decided to return back to, to higher education and decided to enroll at Harvard, mm -hmm. and you alluded to it earlier that mm -hmm. you're currently taking classes. Um, so 30 years after getting your degree at Howard, what inspired you? What level of commitment does it take to now pursue a degree at one of the, one of the best universities in the country? You know, during COVID, we all, it all messed with us, you know? It messed with me too in my head and in my spirit. Uh, quarantining was the roughest part. Remember that time during COVID where it, we were just all in the house uh, with limited abilities to go out and do things that we were normally accustomed to doing, to not being able to be around your friends, not being able to be around your family. So it had an impact on me. I, I, I suffered a little bit of paranoia uh, a little depression. And I said to myself, Dr. Shivers, when and if things got back to normal, I was going to do something. I'm gonna, I didn't know what it was. I'm going to do something to be around people, do something to... I felt like I needed to check out. So I guess Harvard was an opportunity for me to check in to check out so I could heal, so I could learn, so I could grow. And uh, at that particular time, I didn't know that it was going back to school. I, I just figured, you know, I thought about it. I said, maybe I should go back to school. But you know, I got this busy schedule, being on TV and all that kind of stuff. So I reached out to a couple different schools. And one of those schools was Harvard University. And uh, I reached out to Tommy Amaker, their head coach, who was the former head coach at Seton Hall, former head coach at the University of Michigan, and longtime assistant to Mike Krzyzewski at Duke. And Tommy and I go back 25 years. And I reached out to him and I said that I was interested in going back to school. And he said, you know what? It's funny, I felt like a, a student athlete again. He said, uh, he started recruiting me. He said, you're coming here. <laughs> you're not going anywhere else. And uh, he found a program for me called the Advanced Leadership Initiative. And the Advanced Leadership Initiative Fellowship at Harvard is a one-year program where you bring world leaders in we have to move to campus for a year of intense study and discussion on the problems that face mankind. So he cued me up with the program and all of a sudden out of nowhere in a two and a half to three week span, I had to have my papers written. I had to have my three recommendation letters written. I mean, uh, I had to get three recommendation letters uh, faculty interviews, bios, all that kind of stuff. 
and I cobbled all that stuff together, Dr. Shivers, and I presented it to the universities, to the fellowships, uh, faculty leadership. They had to take a vote. They voted. And uh, like Ohio State, I want to tell you this. This is one thing I'm proud of, and I'm just going to share this with y'all. Uh, in the history of the Advanced Leadership Initiative, which goes back to 20, 2009, there was never a unanimous selection until your man G Money stepped in there. <laughs> 15 and 0. <laughs> 15 and 0. So I ended up going back to school and I'm up at school right now. And, you know, it's been a wonderful experience. Well, I want to make sure that you still feel like you're in school. So I'm going to give you a quick quiz. Okay. Uh, what's the one lesson that you've learned in being, because most days you're, you're educating people in the space of sports. You're telling the story, right? But now you're getting the education. What's the one thing that you are learning or have learned or the biggest takeaway or aha moment since being back in the classroom? You know, I think uh, that's a great question, Dr. Shivers. Uh, we learned about a lot of different things that weren't on my radar. Like for example, we, uh, we go into these deep dives where we go to class on Wednesday. We're in class from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. from Wednesday through Friday, sometimes Saturdays. And we've talked about everything. We've talked about climate change, which really scared me. We had Ray Mabus, who's the former secretary of the Navy, just one particular part of climate change I'll share with you. And he came in and spoke with us about Norfolk, Virginia, largest naval base in the world, uh, which is sinking. It's sinking. And Mr. Mabus said, you know, we're having problems because of climate change with something called king tides. These huge tides that roll in that historically have prohibited men from the shore getting on boats to get out to the big boats in the sea. So he said, in the past, the king tides were bad, but we could navigate them. But now they're getting so bad that we can't get our men from the shore to the sea. And when I can't get my guys on boats, he said, that prohibits us from doing business. And what scared me was the next thing he said, our business is war. That's one thing we learned about. We have also learned about race, a lot of talk about race, human rights. We had this wonderful professor called Mateus Reese, who was an expert in human rights. And he took us through the Declaration of Human Rights, which is established uh, after World War II. Eleanor Roosevelt spearheaded it, which eventually led into the creation of the United Nations. And it's coming off of World War II and the atrocities that took place during that time with that bad man and the millions of people that died. And when you look at the Universal Direc Declaration of Human Rights, you see all of these articles in the paperwork that tell man how he is not supposed to treat man. Which is, which it, it seems like it should be, but it's not. Because we were obviously just coming off one of the great uh, catastrophes of mankind. So I feel proud because I asked Professor Reese a question. Because I'm looking at this Universal Declaration of Human Rights and I'm saying to myself, why do we need these rules in place? And I asked Professor Reese, right in class in front of my cohort, I said, sir, Professor, why do we, why does man, and I was stumbling to ask the question because I didn't understand how to ask the question. I said. And then he, he stepped in front of me and he said, oh, I understand, Gus. The question that you're asking is, 
Why does man have such a propensity toward evil? And I said, yes, sir. That's, I think, what I wanted to ask. And he said, there have been books written about this. But in my opinion, the reason is because man has always known that he could get ahead further by doing bad than by doing good. So, gun control, gun safety, another issue. Mental health, another issue. One in five people have a mental disorder. So, it's a disease that we refuse to acknowledge as a legitimate disease. Just like cancer, just like diabetes, just like Parkinson's, Parkinson's disease, mental illness is a serious, serious matter that's having an effect on us human beings in all areas of life. So those are, I just can't say one, yeah. but I can say uh, uh, a myriad of different things that we've had an opportunity to dive deep in that uh, has helped me become more of a well-rounded person that has put things on my radar that I wasn't even thinking about. And also probably the most important thing is to have a social impact yes. on the world. Yes, that's a great lead in to my next statement. And, and Gus, we didn't talk about this, but um, I'm gonna ask you one or two more questions. And then I think it would be really fun to have two questions to come from the audience. So you have no time to prep. Uh oh. It's just like a game day. Something happens. I got a and you're, freestyle and you, you it like Dougie Fresh in the 80s. Yes, you do. Yes, <laughs> you do. I hope you're good with that. So y'all be thinking of really tough questions. Don't be too hard for, on for the Gus. old man. I'm just kidding. Um, but, but what you were talking about, Gus, is exactly what we spend so much time here at Ohio State talking about, in particular in our office, our Center, Belong, Center for Belonging and Social Change. It is about how do we make sure that people are thinking about the world and the ways that they can make an impact in the world. And you have found a pathway to do that, both through educating yourself, but also um, sharing that knowledge and experience, like what you just did with, with our students and with our community. Are there any other examples, Gus, of way that, that you do that in your everyday life? You're busy, you're on TV a lot, and you're learning a lot about the importance of, of social impact. How do you see that playing out in, in the ways that you live? in the world. You know, we had a great, I had a great, one thing that's great about this Advanced Leadership Initiative Fellowship is that not only do we do our Advanced Leadership Initiative classes Monday and Wednesday from 5 to 6.30, but we get an opportunity to take classes in any school at Harvard, whether it be the Kennedy School of Government, uh, the Divinity School, uh, education, and so on and so forth. Business school, we could take, I could take medical classes, I could take law classes, I could do whatever whatever you want. But I, I spent most of my time in the divinity department. Uh, I had a great class, a couple of great classes there. One class was called uh, um, Ancient Eastern Western Philosophy. So we studied Hinduism, Buddhism. We studied Confucius, which is all really cool stuff. But one of the characters that came out for me that had an impact on me was the Buddha. And when the Buddha sat under the tree and gained enlightenment, he realized something. And these words to me were very simple but very profound. He said, we humans suffer. And we suffer because of our desires. And in order to end suffering, we have to have compassion. And in order to have compassion, we have to sacrifice. So think about that. We humans suffer because of our desires, greed, envy, hatred, and so on and fo so forth. You know, basically the seven deadly sins. 
And in order to end suffering, we have to do something and sacrifice something because we're looking to end suffering through sacrifice and compassion. So basically what that means is I got to not make it about me. When I don't make it about me and make it about somebody else, then all of a sudden I can experience that kind of happiness, that nirvana, because it's not about me. That's what I see when I come to Ohio State. You know, I come to Ohio State, and I, and I know I'm getting off target a little bit, but I come to Ohio State, and one thing, and I travel all around the country, all different kinds of universities, every one that's big time. And one thing I realize about being at Ohio State is just there's a feeling of goodness. People, these, these administrators, these teachers, these coaches, they want the kids to do well. They want you guys to do well. And they create an atmosphere where you can do well, where you do have support. You don't have to prove it at first. You can grow into it. So getting back to your initial question about what I see, I try to help on a macro level, meaning I see my broadcast sometimes is like a ministry. I want everybody to come in that's watching the game, rooting for their team and allowing me to come into their homes for the past 30 years, which is a big deal for somebody to let you come into their house and spend time with their family and spend time during their off time and spend time with something that is important and favorable to them. And you get the chance to do that for 30 years. You know, there's something that I learned in one of my divinity classes called collective effervescence. Collective effervescence is when, you know, you go to church and there's a priest, you know, in order to have collective effervescence, you have to have a, a guide, a priest, a shaman, a rabbi, something like that. And it's this feeling that you get. You know, it's a feeling that you get with collective effervescence when you're in church and the priest or the pastor or the rabbi gets you up into a, a high spiritual vibration and we all come together and we all serve as one during that time. Well, I see, and then we, after that moment is over, we come down and we walk out and we look forward to spending that same amount of time the next week. Now, this doesn't necessarily have to come in church. It could come through a concert. You know, Freddie Mercury, Live Aid, back in the 80s, he had 100,000 people rocking in London. They were all connected. And it was to help, you know, beat this nasty virus that had, you know, plagued us in the world at that time, very similar to what we saw with COVID. But talking to my professors, that can also be shared in sporting events. You know how it is in sporting events. Kentucky can be playing Louisville in basketball and the Kentucky fans are rooting for themselves and the Louisville fans are rooting for themselves. But at the same time, we're in the same arena and it's on TV and we're all coming together and we're all waiting for that big shot to decide the game. Well, for me, like that priest, like that shaman, like that rabbi, as a sportscaster, having a chance to go into the homes of between five and 20 million people every weekend for 25 years, 30 years. I feel like that's my role. That's part of my journey. That's part of my, my ministry, my fellowship, that I can be that guy, that person, that brings everybody together during this exciting emotional period of life, which is a game, bring us all together and then take that energy and blast it out to between five and 20 million people. You know, I can't, you know, tell you how, uh, 
important that is for me in my life. My little life. Coming from the west side of Detroit. Growing up with my dad, who never went past the third grade, and my mom. Just us three. To be able to, I mean, I see the divinity in the good Lord giving me an opportunity to have a job like my job because I thought I was going to end up working at the plant too, just like my dad, and that would have been cool. But the good Lord has something different in mind for me, mm -hmm. and no way in the world would I have ever thought that I would be sitting here at Ohio State University having a chance to connect and communicate, and that's another thing that the Buddha said that really spun my cap. He said, you can experience happiness even in tragedy. You can experience happiness if you understand how to be where your feet are, present. You can experience happiness in almost every moment of life. For example, all right, we're all sitting here together. All of us are having this experience together at this particular moment in time in our short lives. And I don't know if you feel like I do right now, in this very moment, in this very moment, I'm happy. I'm really happy. I'm happy to see you. I love your outfit, your red and your black. I love yours too. Yeah. I see this kid with his Ohio State hat on. He's got his fat gold chain on too, so. <laughs> Looking like a B-boy. <laughs> I'm a B-boy standing in my B-boy stance, you know? But, I mean, that's the thing, you know, Dr. Shivers. Yes. Just to be able to be connected. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I have one last question. Mm. And I think you've talked about it because you, you love Ohio State. I want everybody to record that. Gus loves the Ohio State University. The world famous. The world famous. Ohio State We need to University. spread that That's around, right. guys. That's right. That's an ode to Jesse Owens. What does it mean to be a Buckeye? What does it mean to be a Buckeye, in my opinion, from what I've seen? And I'm not a Buckeye in, on paper, but I feel like I'm a Buckeye in spirit. Mm -hmm. From what I've seen, what it means to be a Buckeye is someone that is willing to sacrifice on a macro level, or maybe even on a micro level, one of the two. But to sacrifice, to have commitment and compassion. That's what I know about this university. I know that. Beyond a shadow of a doubt, I know that the people here care. And the people here aren't too hard on their kids, they make mistakes, that happens, we understand that, but we're gonna support our kids because Ohio State University, based on Jesse Owens, in my opinion, going all the way back to 1936 and the things I read to you about that man, Ohio State stands 10 feet tall and is always ready for a challenge and is always gonna support their people, their coaches, their players, their students, through sacrifice, commitment, and compassion, which basically means to do something for somebody other than yourself. I know I promised that there would be two questions and then we're gonna move to the next really important part of this program. Um, Matt and Dante, Dante, um, if you have the question, you think you can't let Gus Johnson leave the Ohio State University without asking the question, 
raise your hand. We'll see, we got somebody already. We got, oh, 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 Dante, good luck with that. Good luck. And if you could use the microphone and just give us your name um, before you pose your question, that would be great. Hi. Hi, I'm Anthony Williams. Hi. Hello. This is just word association, three words. Oh. Family. Everything. Trust. Don't got a lot of it. <laughs> Golf. I suck. <laughs> I don't even know how to follow that, so I'm not. Got to work on your golf game. Oh guys. man, I got. I've given up on that thing. <laughs> <laughs> Dante, who do you have? Hi, uh, my name is Jacob, and hey, Jacob. my question to you is: um, at the beginning of the week, when you see that you're going to Ohio State, what is your immediate reaction? Ooh, that's good. Happiness, because my lady lives in Columbus. <laughs> You just earned so many points from so many people. You know, I just, I just, you know, I, I, you know, I gotta, I gotta just. I love it. I don't understand. You know, I'm from Michigan, and I gotta come <laughs> out of said, all the places in the world. The love of my life is from Columbus, Ohio. Which that is was perfect. born at Ohio State University. Perfect. It's perfect. It's perfect. Good answer. I mean, yeah. that was really. Where is she? All right. Uh, give her a shout out. All right. Got it. Got it. Got it. All right, one more question and then we're moving. Uh, I would like to say thank you for during the COVID pandemic calling um, the Ohio State versus Nebraska game and the Ohio State versus Indiana game. Those were two wonderful games and hearing you call out was an inspiration. But I wanted to ask you, you talked a little bit about um, thinking that you were going to go to the factory and work there like your father did. What in between that and going to Howard did the Lord give you your calling to not only do play-by-play, play, but do play-by-play play for mostly college, uh, and at the time, amateur athletes. My mother. Mm. Mommy, uh... I miss her. She, uh, talk about sacrifice. She sacrificed everything for me. She, uh, she wanted me to be something. I was her, uh, I was her work of art. And, uh, unfortunately, she didn't get to see all this. She would have been so proud. And I tried to make her proud. But she cued me up. She put me on the path. She had the heart of a heart of gold. She sacrificed everything to me for me as her only child. She did it with compassion and commitment. And she was relentless. I always like to say, my parents. My mother was the greatest offensive coordinator a boy could ever have. <laughs> she had better plays than Ryan Day, baby. <laughs> we were throwing it all over the field. And we could run it. Um, so as mommy, mommy was, uh, it was my mother, man. She, there's nothing like the love of a mother. Straight up. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you all for your wonderful questions. Too. This person today that we're honoring for the What It Means to Be a Buckeye, our inaugural award, is a person that comes from very humble beginnings, a person that has sacrificed many things to help other people. He's sacrifice things when nobody was looking. He wasn't looking for accolades, attaboys, pats on the back. He just decided to do something that he knew he needed to do to make this world a better place and to help kids 
just as important. This person is a Buckeye. And he established this entity through the beautiful game. Let's take a look at the videotape. Soccer in the United States back in the 80s was an unpopular sport. It lacked the prestige and national appeal of the traditional American sports like football, basketball, and baseball. Black players like Desmond Armstrong and Pele stood out as soccer superstars. And though their efforts to break out as some of soccer's favorites were appreciated, the United States hadn't quite caught on to the hype. But two black brothers, Dr. Anthony Williams and Larry Williams, born and raised in what was at one time the steel mill city of Youngstown, Ohio, figured out a way to bring the game of soccer to life. And that they did. At that time, soccer was, in this country, was just starting to take off. A vision of a soccer league was conceived. The Columbus Metro Soccer Association. Established near the east side of Columbus in a historic black neighborhood called Franklin Park, Dr. Williams began his journey to harvest greatness without realizing it. Motivated by the lack of playing opportunities his oldest son faced as a youth soccer player playing in the suburbs of Guyana, Ohio, Dr. Williams made the conscious decision to create something new, something deliberate, something transformative. If the why is big enough, the how doesn't matter. Coach Anthony and Coach Larry put together one of the fiercest and most talented select soccer teams the city of Columbus had ever seen and named them the Zulus. This team had it all. A high level of talent, style, the swagger was crazy, <laughs> and skill that impressed people from all over. They were little in size, but were unstoppable. Winning game after game, championship after championship, these boys were the real deal. They came with confidence and they came with spirit and they had personality. And in some ways you were beat before the whistle even blew. These young boys grew to be young men who eventually continued to pursue their athletic careers at colleges and universities all across the country. Schools that most players only dream to attend, Yale, Brown, Johns Hopkins, Howard, Guilford, UMass, Davidson, the University of South Carolina, Harvard, Ohio Wesleyan, Morehouse, Purdue, and the world famous Ohio State University, to name a few. Today, they're doctors, dentists, they work on Wall Street, are vice presidents of large corporations, they're teachers, own their own businesses, and that was the success. That was the real legacy of the Columbus Metro Soccer Association. Like the trunk of a seeded tree with strong and healthy roots that over time grew to be tall and mature with thick branches spanning from one end to the other. CMSA was that family tree a tree amongst all the other hundreds that surrounded the CMSA family at Franklin Park in 1985, back where it all started. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure and Ohio State University's pleasure to announce the recipient of the first ever What It Means to Be a Buckeye Award to Dr. Anthony Williams. Wow. Wow. It's unbelievable. <laughs> I, um, this is so moving in so many ways, and, and I hope that I represent everyone in this room um, by sharing the emotion around this. Um, I look at that. And, and look at those young people. 
I see myself. I just want to thank you. I thank you for your commitment, for your passion, uh, for doing things the Buckeye way and making sacrifices that you made early in your life to help people who probably didn't have inspiration or motivation uh, to uh, chase dreams. You created an atmosphere that's unbelievable. So thank you for that. And uh, you're a shining star for all of us. And uh, congratulations on this award. Unbelievable. Congratulations. I'd like to read what the award says first. What it means to be a Buckeye. And it's got the Jesse Owens wreath. Presented to Dr. Anthony Williams, service, sacrifice, compassion. I know I've changed a little bit since uh, 1985. <laughs> But this is uh, totally unexpected. I mean, this is like a left hook to the jaw. <laughs> I had no idea. Uh, but I'm very humble. Uh, this is probably one of the greatest honors I've ever received. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm, I'm thankful for the posterity that uh, I see behind me and some of the young men uh, that we were able to uh, raise up with the uh, help of their parents, strong parental input in this whole thing. Uh, I just flew by the seat of my pants and let God uh, uh, take my passion to wherever it would go. So I, I don't claim uh, to be the, uh, uh, the owner or director of any of this stuff. I just as the young people say, do what you do. <laughs> so, and it was, a, it was a small window of time, but I gave it all my effort, 100%. And so, uh, again, I'm grateful, and uh, this is a, a great day for me, and I appreciate everything. Thank you.